Hello everybody and welcome to one of our fantastic Open University events for International Women's Day. I'm Josie Fraser, I'm really delighted to be here to chair this session with four amazing women from our Open University academic community who are all making fantastic contributions to the Open University's research effort in very different ways. I'm really um, excited to have the opportunity to have a good chat with them today. Um, and we're delighted to welcome um, a range of colleagues from across the OU and much wider into this conversation. I promised I'd start with a little bit of background on myself. Um, I'm uh, originally a neurobiologist. I started my um, education going to university at 18, uh, thinking that I was going to be a medical researcher who was going to cure cancer and then had the fantastic experience of realizing that I found cancer quite boring actually in the middle of my degree, but found the brain really fascinating and moved into neuroscience. Um, I went to university at 18 and have never left in one way or another. And I've had periods of time where I've been very research focused and very research intensive. Uh, periods of time where I've been very teaching focused and very teaching intensive. And at the moment, it's all about leadership and management for me, which is um, a different phase of my career that I'm really enjoying in a different way. Um, I think it's fantastic that the Open University recognises and is involved with International Women's Day. And I'm particularly excited to host an event that is focused on women and their contribution to research and the fantastic research that goes on at the OU never fails to inspire me. And hopefully hearing about some of our great female researchers and their work today will do the same for many of you. I'm involved in the Women at Open University group. Uh, I'm a member of the Aurora programme. I'm the Aurora champion for the Open University, but I also try to, at least once a year, get to an event uh, with Aurorans to role model there. And I'm also part of the um, Gender Equality Steering Group that looks to make sure that we're doing a really good job at the OU around gender equality, including our work with Athena Swan. I promised I'd speak about a woman that inspired me and there's almost too many to choose from. Um, but I, the person that sprang to mind immediately given our research focus was actually one of my first bosses, uh, Ros Ridley, who was Vice Principal of Newnham College at Cambridge and was my boss when I worked for the Medical Research Council team at Cambridge University in the psychology department there. And Ros inspired me in many, many ways. She ran a research team that did some fantastic work in a really interesting way. Uh, she ran the team giving opportunities to sandwich students from all kinds of universities across the UK, uh, bringing them into Cambridge for a year to work, um, publishing a huge amount um, in, the, in the biomedical research fields that we were, we were involved in. But also um, she managed to be just one of those people that, that is a really caring and considerate boss. I still don't know how we managed to do our research timetable in those days, but we all stopped for tea breaks at 10.30 together and at 3.30 in the afternoon together. And bearing in mind that a lot of the work we were doing um, involved studies of animal behavior and so on. I still can't figure out to this day how we all managed to stop and have that chatting, catching up, checking in time um, every day of the week. She was one of those people who could have annoyed you by being really good at everything. We had beautiful watercolor paintings in the office that were her paintings, um, as well as being an amazing scientist. She was a great artist as well. And the only thing, honestly, that, 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 that made it tolerable was that she was a terrible driver. Um, and we had a building where to get out of the car park, there was a really wide gate and Ros clipped it more than once in the three years that I worked with her. But she just inspired me in taking care of the people that she worked with and, and, and the people that worked for her, always wanting to make sure that we were doing really good science, but that we were also all getting a lot personally out of working in the team and she's continued to inspire me um, throughout my career. We hope that today you'll get to hear a little bit 
about um, these four OU researchers, their journeys and the people that inspire them. And we're delighted to take questions from you to any of the panel today. And you'll see there's a Q&A tab on Zoom where you can log your questions. And as we get into the discussion part of the, um, of the session, I will try to pull questions out that you've posted in, in the chat, as well as anything else that strikes us as we go along. So I'm really looking forward to a fantastic conversation today. And I'm delighted to introduce you to the four uh, academics that are with me for the panel. So I'm gonna start with Jenny. Jenny, would you tell us a little bit about who you are and your background, please? Hi, hello, Josie. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm Jenny Douglas. I'm a senior lecturer in health promotion at the Open University. And I've been at the Open University since 1999. So my focus is very much on um, public health and inequalities in health. Um, in terms of uh, my, my kind of um, personal background, I'm, I'm a child of Windrush. So my parents came to, um, came to the UK um, in the 50s from Jamaica and, um, and then I arrived. <laughs> so I was born in the UK, but I feel very much, it's quite interesting. I feel very much black British and very much black Caribbean. Fantastic. It's great to, great to hear about where you've come from, Jenny. You talked a little bit about your area of research around health inequalities. Do you want to expand on that a little bit and, and also maybe take us into who inspires you and why? OK, well, I'll talk about health inequalities first and then I'll talk about who inspires me because I really want to talk about her. Um, I've kind of had a focus on health inequalities throughout my career, both my academic career but before um, I was an academic, um, before I came to the OU, I was at Birmingham University. And before that, I was head of health promotion units in West Birmingham, in Birmingham, and in Sandwell, which covers um, Smethwick, West Bromwich. And so health inequalities, you could actually, you could see the health inequalities in those areas. Health in inequalities in terms of, you know, people who are living in poverty, um, black and minority ethnic people. And, and so really that kind of experience um, has followed me through to the OU. And I was very lucky in both Sandwell and West Birmingham to receive funding from the Health Education Council, as it was then, to look at the health needs of black and minority ethnic communities. And I look specifically at coronary heart disease and the factors which influenced coronary heart disease, um, and as well as looking at um, kind of lifestyle and behavior, we focus very much on the social and economic and political factors. And it's interesting, I've been, this last weekend, I've been going back to some of my early papers um, because, you know, recently we've now got a focus because of the impact of COVID on black and minority ethnic communities. There is a focus on inequalities in health in black communities and a focus on discussing racial discrimination. And so I just had to prove to myself that I was writing about this way back in the 80s. <laughs> so the person who inspires me and has inspired me since I was a young adult is Angela Davis. Just going to put a little. <laughs> Excellent. And Angela Davis um, is, she's now a retired professor. Um, but she was kind of very, it's interesting because we talk about, you know, challenge, you know, this, that we must challenge issues. That's the theme for this year. Angela Davis was challenging issues in the, in the seventies as a, as a young lecturer. Um, and um, she, she's inspired me because she um, is very kind of intellectual. She's also very committed to social justice. And I don't know how, I grew up in Wolverhampton. So I don't Me know too. where- hmm? Me too. Oh, oh right, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably around about the same time. 
I, I went to, because um, my parents, where we lived was Goldthorn Park, which was on the boundary with Sedgley. So I went to an all white grammar school. So I was the only black person, and it was person, in, in all the time I was there in that grammar wow. school. So I don't know where I learned about Angela Davis because, um, you know, I was reading her work in the 1970s and it really spoke to me because she spoke about how race, gender and class, you know, affect you, you know, as, as a black woman. And, um, you know, being black and being working class, it really spoke to me. So I'm not sure where I find, I was thinking, where did I find out about Angela Davis? But I don't know whether, <laughs> whether you did this, Josie, but I was very, I was very into um, Northern Soul. And so unknown to my parents, mm -hmm. I would go to a Northern Soul club with some friends, a very good friend, of, who's still a good friend of mine, Claudia. Um, and of course, you know, would then go and buy records. My parents were very religious. So they, they <laughs> when they found out, I was actually banned from doing this. But um, in a lot of these kind of record shops, there was a lot of discussion about what was happening in, you know, in terms of US politics and in terms of US black politics. And I think that is where I learned about Angela Davis. So it's also a lesson that, you know, where we get education from, that, you know, we, we kind of retrieve education from a whole range of resources. But I wanted to be like Angela Davis when I was 17, and I still want to be like Angela Davis. <laughs> but she's still, she's a real inspiration. That's fantastic. What a great example. Thanks so much, Jenny. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your research in this area as we chat further. Cincia, I'm going to pass on to you to introduce yourself, please. Thank you, Josie, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm um, Cinzia Priola. I work as a senior lecturer in uh, the Faculty of Business Law at OU. I trained as a psychologist. I, I gra first graduated, I did my first uh, long degree in, um, in psychology in Italy, and then I specialized in work and organizational psychology, and that's how I ended up working in um, in business schools. I, uh, during my career, have to say that um, my work is becoming more and more multidisciplinary. So I've been interested in, uh, uh, and I am interested in sociology, in philosophy, and in critical theory. So I combined um, my um, reading and my interest similar to, um, uh, to what, um, Jenny was just saying, uh, my personal interest in my reading into my uh, my research work and my um, uh, my teaching too. So my research focuses on equality, diversity, inclusion in the workplace, um, and uh, I try to understand what are the pro processes and the practices that prevent women from realizing their potentials. In, uh, in work, in organizations, uh, and how these are related to, um, to the socio-historical development of societies in which, for example, organization operate. I'm not, I'm interested in, uh, my main uh, research focus is on gender, uh, but I'm also interested in, uh, in other groups and understanding the experience of other groups that are, um, they've been ostracized in society. So I've done work in, uh, um, with disabled people and disabled women um, and with LGBTQ people uh, and their experiences in, um, in organizations. Um, so, although not all my uh, research projects, most of my research projects have tried to look at experience of people within organization, but then also look at, at the intersection between work and society um, and how this affects uh, the experience, the potential, and then the career of, um, of women in particular. Um, in terms of uh, women that have expired me, um, as you were talking particularly, uh, Jenny, I and, and Josie, I 
um, I was trying to identify the person that inspired me. I've always struggled in giving one name. When people <laughs> say, who is your favorite author? And too many come to my mind. Or who is your favorite band or singer? So um, I'm sure you all sh share one name. And I love the work um, of Angela Davis, for example. But I think I find inspiration in different people. The woman that inspires me is one who works hard um, and does the work very well. I always feel I never work as hard as the woman that inspires me. Um, but, and I think uh, this is what Josie also mentioned, is this woman that inspires also the one that nurtures and mentors and uh, mentors newcomers, but also as a, as a, a more caring leadership style. Um, I admire the women that break molds, that succeed in a um, male-dominated environment, and they don't make too many compromises, so they remain, um, they, they remain faithful to, to their principle, and they've got uh, an integrity that can be perceived by people that work with them. Um, so I think there are a few women that are like that. Um, and that's why I don't want to put a name on. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great list for us all to aspire to, Jensia. Thank <laughs> you for that. I'm going to next ask Kate to introduce herself. Kate. Hi Josie, hi everybody. I just want to say first it's such a pleasure to be here and to be meeting all you guys and hearing about your fantastic, fantastic work. It's such a pleasure. Um, so my name's Kate. Um, I'm a lecturer in education in, um, in Faculty of Wales. My particular area of interest is inclusion, accessibility and mental well-being and how we can embed this in our pedagogy and our curriculum and basically make, make education a better space, a more positive space for students who are disabled, have mental health difficulties or have other disadvantages. In terms of background, um, I come from a rather non-traditional educational background. Um, I was a widening participation student and was a school refuser. So I left school at 14 with no qualifications or anything and went to work because I just had such a rough time in formal education and just decided that it wasn't for me basically and that I wasn't somebody who could get a degree or anything like that and should just go out to work. And I kind of carried on that way for many years just thinking that I wasn't um, wasn't cut out for any kind of education um, until I discovered the OU when I was 21. So woefully unprepared for higher education. It took me a long time to find my way through and sort of learn the skills and things that I needed. But studying at the OU was such a very, very different experience for me than all my previous educational experience because for the first time I was in a place where I could study on my own terms, with my own timetable, and nobody, and people were incredibly supportive, you know, the OU is incredibly compassionate, but nobody was judging me as part of that, and that was such an incredibly powerful experience for me, and that experience is what pushed me to completely change my career, because I was used to work in marketing, um, and um, go into education, and start, so I was a teacher for 11 years, um, and then a lecturer afterwards, a lecturer in education. And now I've kind of really, the focus of my life is on how we can make education more inclusive and give other people like me the chance to really show their potential. What a fantastic journey, Kate. And I think you should be a marketing person for the OU. <laughs> um, it certainly shows what it's achieved and, and supported you with. and and. It's always lovely to hear the stories from OU students and alumni. They're always so inspiring. Do you want to talk about um, a, partic a particular element of your research, perhaps a little bit, and who inspires you and why? Yeah, sure. Um, pleasure. So most of my research is in accessibility for disabled students um, and inclusive pedagogies, inclusive curricula for students with mental health issues. So I also work for Advanced HE um, and I co-lead on the project around embedding mental well-being in the curriculum. So embedding mental well-being in curricula and pedagogies is a, is a major focus for me and we've got a big project going on on that at the moment. And the other side of things is around how we can make education more inclusive for students with disabilities. And it's so easy to think of students with disabilities as a homogenous group who all need the same things and it's just really not like that. 
And so that's a big part of my research is finding the different ways in which we can embed inclusion into different aspects of education. And this includes everything right from the very get go. So um, I've been involved in several projects looking at how students can disclose disabilities in a really inclusive way. So using AI and the kind of technology that we can use and the kind of systems that we can use to support them. And then right the way through how the curriculum can be designed, how the technology can be designed, how this can work in an online space. Um, how the, the tutorials, the pedagogies, assessment, and all the way through to support students so that education can just become this really positive space. Oh, and a person who inspires me. Sorry, that was the other question. Um, no, I'm going to do with Jenny and wave a book around. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. So Jane Seal, I would like to name as the person who inspires me. There, I mean, like both Cynthia and Jenny said, there are so many inspirational women. It was really, really hard to pick one. Uh, but Jane Seal, I would like to name as the person who's just really shaped the direction that I'm going in. Like the first time I found her book and she, she started to, she has a whole chapter around identifying silences and the mediating voices and how so it's so important in inclusion in participatory research, not to just listen to the voices of stakeholders, but to identify those silences and those voices that have been mediated. So building on the work of people like Bell Hooks and people like that. And that was just like a bell clanging in my head that it was that was something I needed to really do for the rest of my life. Very interesting thank you what a great example. So last but by no means least over to Miriam would you introduce yourself in your area of research Miriam please. Thank you Jose. Hi everyone it's a, it's a big pleasure to be here also thanks to the organizers of this event. Uh, my name is uh, Miriam Fernandez I'm a senior research fellow at KMI in STEM. Um, my background, so my background is in computing. I study computer science in Madrid. I study my master's, my five year master's there. I think we were about 20 girls out of 400 students that we, sta we started in that year, in the same year. Uh, then I did my PhD also in computing as well in Madrid, in Spain, uh, where I was the only female member of my PhD group. Um, then I moved to the tech industry for a while, and then I came back to academia. Uh, in terms of my research, so I do research on the web, uh, particularly with a focus on online harm. So I investigate misinformation spreading, uh, hate, radicalization, uh, algorithmic biases, um, in particularly very related to today's. I investigate uh, misogyny and in particularly extreme misogyny. I don't know if many people here will be aware that there is something called the manosphere which are extreme misogynistic groups on the web up to the point that people have started calling them uh, or, or try to categorize them as extremist and terrorist groups because they have committed already several terrorist attacks around the world uh, driven by their extreme hatred on women. So with Dr. Tracy Farrell, um, we started investigating these communities some years ago uh, we analyze these communities at scale. So these communities have been analyzed by feminist scholars for years, but of course at, at a smaller scale. So analyzing more than 6 million posts over years, we perceive how these communities are becoming more and more extreme and more and more hateful, uh, which of course is, is becoming a problem, right? How you understand what is going on how you get into the mentality of these people and how you manage to change their perspectives. Uh, and it is something we are looking at. The other thing that we have been looking at recently is misogynoir, which is misogyny specifically targeted at black women. And um, particularly we have been looking at that in, into the tech community. I don't know if you have recently seen that Google and find interest and other highly profile media technology uh, technology companies, they fired some of their most prominent black women uh, in a very unfairly way. And so we are studying how people are reacting offline, uh, online to the uh, these women sharing their experiences. 
And the other thing that I do that is very related to the day is investigating algorithmic biases. And here I just want to point to a book of Caroline Criado, Invisible Women. I don't know if you have uh, uh, read that book. It's, uh, it's, a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic material to read. And uh, you have it there, Josie, I have it here <laughs> as well. Uh, so it actually, it amazed me when I started reading and I saw how in technology and science, because we haven't considered data for women, the, all the solutions that we were created, they were not as effective for women as they are for men. So for example, if you, had a car, if you have a car accident, you are much more likely to get severely injured and die simply because the seatbelt and other security measures were designed for the, for the height and the weight of men, not of women, right? Similarly, if you go to industries and where they use chemical products, they analyze the security of those products for the skin of men, which is thicker. So safety, measure, safety measures that, you know, or, or measures that were supposed to be safe for men, they haven't been safe for women for many years. And that happens in all areas of technology development and science. And one of the things we look at is how to avoid these biases, particularly uh, when it comes to algorithm development. Um, in terms of a woman that inspires me, I have the same issue that all the women here before, I struggled to pick up just one. But if I had to choose one that personally inspired me, I had to choose my mom. And the reason why I choose her is because she born in 1948 in Spain when there was not even democracy. Uh, in Spain, there was a dictatorship at that time and women had no rights. I mean, literally no rights. So if you get married to your husband at a time, most of women had to stop working. They couldn't, they couldn't own property. Uh, so both in law and culture, there were many inequalities and she chose to challenge. So she started working at 13. She kept studying at night to be able to get a, a degree. She graduated, she managed to graduate working full time and studying at night. She managed to graduate by the age of 18. She worked her full life until she retired at age 65. Hardworking, incredibly hardworking person. She always encouraged me to be independent, as independent as I could be. So no matter what I did in life, no matter which direction I would take in life, I, the only thing she always teach me to do is to be independent, to learn, to learn as much as I could, to be able to do things on my own and to be able to follow every direction that I, I wanted to follow because I will have the resources and the tools to follow that direction. What a fantastic example. And absolutely perfect for the theme of International Women's Day this year as well. I think that came through with all of the examples about that ability to challenge. And, and, and I think that's probably an essential as well with our topic of women in research. We know that you know women are 50% of the population. They're, they're often more than 50% of the undergraduate population. And yet, the number of women professors is significantly lower than the number of men that reach professorial status. Um, the number of black women professors, when I started my career, you could still count black women professors in the UK on your fingers. I know we've moved on a bit, but it's still, you know, pretty, pretty scary. So, so I think I'm going to kick us off with a question for the panel. Um, from a research point of view, what changes have you seen or noticed over your career? And um, maybe I'll start start with Jenny and then and then open it to anyone else. Um, it's interesting because, um, like you, uh, my first degree is in microbiology and virology, and, and I have a master's in environmental pollution control, and then I did a master's in the sociology of health. And then, so my PhD is in medical sociology. And what I have noticed, because I didn't kind of plan to do those things, but what I've noticed is how there is now a focus on interdisciplinary research. 
and how important that is. So for example, if I am looking at the health of black women, I know that it's important to look at both the social, the economic, the political, the environmental factors that influence health. And I can see that research is kind of moving in that direction where you know we're not working in as siloed ways as we used to. Um, I'm currently a co-investigator on a research project at Oxford, an ESRC research project, looking at the experiences that um, people have had in relation to COVID. And we're looking particularly at um, black and minority ethnic people. And, and you know, within our kind of team, our multidisciplinary team, I can see, you know, the kind of um, the expertise that each member of the team brings. And I think that that now we're starting to do that much more. Yeah, so that, that's a really interesting perspective. I've noticed that change as well. We're, we are much more multi and interdisciplinary in the topics that we address and how we work with each other. That is, that is a really, really good point. Anyone else want to come in? I, I would just comment as well on my side. I think in terms of um, how are we seeing uh, equality? Uh, I think uh, people is much more aware, uh, even from top, not just bottom up, but top down. So you would see national funding programs. And now, for example, Horizon Europe has established uh, the gender plans and the fact that organizations need to have a gender equality plan in place to be able to access that funding. So I think there is a, a more and more recognition that there is quite a lot of issues that still need to be addressed. And there is uh, a lot of effort from many sides to try to uh, push for change. Yeah, thanks, Miriam. It's a, it's a good point. I think the funding bodies are paying much closer attention to equality than probably ever in my career. Cynthia, did you want to come in? Yes, I was, um, I, was uh, I agree with, um, uh, with Jenny and, and Miriam about um, variety of um, um, of approaches and I think in management and organizational studies certainly over the last uh, 20 years I've been uh, um, working in higher education I could see much more also pluralism of, of approaches and um, while uh, uh, probably um, even 30 years ago there was much more uh, focus on mainstream quantitative uh, for example, a uh, business that was grounded on economics now is much more, um, there's variety of approaches, there's much more pluralism, grounded more in sociology and political economy, or at least there is more space for people that do that work, for example, to, uh, to publish in, um, um, in international journals and so on. However, if I think about what's happening now, literally in this last year or so, um, I could see also um, a closure, closure that is happening to uh, the critical perspective that are challenging the status quo. And the only thing I can interpret it is, is, is when resources are getting scarce and obviously universities uh, are experiencing um, economic challenges due to uh, COVID, for example, I, I see that uh, the closure is coming. Uh, there are certain groups that are possibly um, within certain intellectual tradition, they are closing in. They're trying to put, protect almost their own turf to the disadvantage of, of other groups. And I think we need to be mindful of this as you know, in the future, as uh, as our um, uh, discipline and our work um, evolves. Um, I, I'm a feminist. I do feminist work, uh, and I, I am an inclusive feminist. I, I'm, you know, for value of solidarity is solidarity among all who identify as women, but also. I seek allies in men, uh, among men, and I work with men. Um, and I mean, why am I saying this? I'm saying this, I suppose, because there are people that want to claim that, for example, feminism is only for um, 
cheese is is about cheese women only struggles and i don't see women as an homogeneous group i think some of you have said that um we are um what my experience of uh, you know a woman living in uh, or being brought up in a in an italian island is very different to that of a, a woman in the uk or a black woman in the uk or a black woman in africa or a, a, a woman of, of color in asia and so also the experience for example of transgender women is very different and um i i don't believe that experiences of um, for example, the experience of cheese women um, um, preclude from understanding the experience, the, the struggle, for example, that transgender women have had in coming to terms with their own gender. Um, the fact that I was born a woman um, does not make me more entitled to certain spaces. Um, and therefore, for me, is about continuing to ch to challenge male domination, gender violence, gender injustice, gender discrimination, where equality is a value. So I suppose I try, I, I, you know, I diverge a little bit from uh, where we are going in a in a research discipline. But I feel, I feel that we need to be mindful of um, a certain tendency when resources become scarce. I think, in particular. That feeds really nicely into a couple more of my questions. Um, there's 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 one that, that I have in my in my in my head, but actually we've got a question that's come in from from the audience, which I think is also really relevant and, and feeds nicely from from those answers. So so a, co a colleague has posted that pointing out that most of us in academia have a certain class background, making us part of fairly elite policy and academic contexts and uh, the question is how can we look into our positionality and make research more participatory in terms of not just gender but class as well I think it's a really interesting question Kate I'm aware I didn't bring you in on the last one do you want to kick us off with this one yeah absolutely participatory research is something I've been involved in, in for many years now and I'm very passionate about it's, we need to recognize when we do participatory research in order for it to be truly participatory and not tokenistic, it will take more time, it will take more money and it needs to be very carefully planned so that the participation is real. So we need to make sure that we are identifying those silences and those mediated voices to go back to Jane Seal again, um, making sure that we are bringing people in to everything we do, respecting their positions, sitting back and listening to them and giving them a real authentic space to speak and be part of this. And then making sure that they're involved right the way through the process as well. So Jane and also John T. Ricks do a lot of work on this by making sure that people, uh, participants are involved in the planning stage right the way through the research, including the dissemination and the analysis and all the different aspects. So. I think participation is absolutely key. And actually, it was one of the things I was going to bring up for the last question about how I think the, this is the way that research is changing. Even just in the time that I've been involved, I'm seeing much, much more focus on participatory research and, and compassion in research as well. Yeah, it's an interesting reflection. And obviously, Miriam, this also connects across to, to areas of interest for you too. Do you want to pick up on, on Amna's question? Yeah, I want to pick up on something, but I'm going to go to a lower level. I come from a from a very low um, so low economic background. I come from a very humble family. The only reason I'm here today is because I grew up in a country where education was free. So for me, doing my bachelor degree, my master's degree, and my PhD degree was nearly free. The registration was by far, you know, uh, cheaper than is here in the UK. And I think that this, this is a change because you, this needs to change or this must change here in the UK because by, by having an education that is so expensive, you are ex excluding many people from reaching up to this level. You know, that's why the OU is such a great project in terms of education here in the UK because it's actually breaking some economical barriers and, and, and access barriers to many people, but still, 
I do believe that if we really want to have a disciplinary research and an integratory environment for research, uh, we should work on making education accessible and free for everyone, to be honest. Mm. It's, I, I think it, yeah, a bit in, including as many people as possible in participation as subjects or as participants in the research is one thing, but including as many people as possible in, in that, um, as the question describes, rather elite academic context is also important too. Um, because you, you do bring your background with you, don't you, as you, as you move forward in life uh, in, in many different ways. Um, so I think that variance in viewpoint and background and history um, is really, really potentially helpful. Um, Cynthia, would you like to come in on this one? Yes, I suppose it's the other aspect of inclusivity. And we are um, certainly, um, I'll say possibly there are more um, working class academics that people perceive, or at least from a working class background. I challenge the position that I think none of us is working class anymore, um, even if we've grown up in a working class um, family. Um, People see, see this very differently in the sense that, you know, you are you're born in a working class and you remain in a working class. There are two schools of thoughts. But I think also the other point for us as an elitist um, environment, I suppose, is how can we communicate what we do for everyone. We write in academic journals and we write in a scientific jargons and we communicate among ourselves uh, in conferences, in seminars and so, and so on and so forth. But a lot of what we do has got implication for the life of everyone. And therefore, I think this is a, one of the biggest challenges. I've got no answer for that, unfortunately. Although possibly social media is uh, doing a little bit uh, in um, um, in 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 sort of spreading some ideas that are originating into into the academic world, but we need to try to make an effort to get out there much more and sort of speak the language of uh, speak a language that is common uh, for you know a common language for everyone, not speaking the academic language that is very elitist. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I am, I'm, I'm terrible at that because that's the only English language I've learned. <laughs> because coming from, uh, you know, speaking Italian until I came, the English I, lang I learned is the English of academia. And um, therefore, I use some uh, strange words. <laughs> but yeah, it's very... it's, it's, sorry. No, please continue. Sorry. No, I said that is one of the biggest challenge, I think, to to um, disseminate outside of academia. It's a mixture, isn't it? It's about bringing people in from all different backgrounds to participate, which we can only do if we're doing research that's relevant to people from all different backgrounds. And then it's also about engaging them so they understand the outcomes that we have and the things that we've learned. And, you know, I'm, I'm from the biomedical world. I, my language is entirely specialist when I'm writing research papers. Um, I, 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 can't, I, I can't say that anything I've written in a research paper would be easily understandable by a member of the public, but actually trying to think about the impact and the impact that research has and how I can connect my research into my teaching and, and, and take that out wider to a general public is really important. And Jenny, I'm guessing you've got some, um, some thoughts on that with your, with your background in, in health education. And um, I'm curious to know how your research affects society and connects to teaching. And maybe we can unpack some of those themes coming out of that last set of answers a bit more. Um, yes, picking up on some of the things that have been said, um, we established the Black Women's Health and Wellbeing Research Network. 10 years ago. And it was for that very reason that, um, that there wasn't a focus on the research of black women and that uh, 
there were a, only a few researchers and they were quite isolated and we felt we needed to you know people wanted to come together in a kind of network where they could discuss their research and their ideas what we did also was to have a number of conferences and seminars and um, those conferences were open to anybody who was interested so we did have a lot of um, women who came who are not academics who were women who are interested in particular aspects of black women's health um, people who worked in the health sector people who worked in social services we also had people that came from um, law firms it was really quite interesting but what we found was that there was a way of putting across information about you know epidemiological information about black women's health which connected to women who were not academics and i think that sometimes as academics we ourselves think that lay people ordinary people won't understand what we're talking about when when they really can and they really have got you know a part to play and they really have you know they can um analyze what is being said and they can contribute to research projects and so i think it's really important that we look at ways in which we can inv involve a whole range of people my focus is on black women and i don't make any apology for that because black women are the are least well served by our health services and actually under researched and we can see that at the moment in terms of um, recent work I've been doing around black women and maternal mortality, that black women are five times, I didn't do the five, but <laughs> five times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth than white women. Now, but we don't know exactly why that should be. I, the, 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 it is very complex, but are we doing the research in order to be able to understand that terrible phenomenon. I mean, if it was happening to any other sector of society, that one group was five times more likely to die than another group, I'm sure there'd be a much bigger focus on it. So, so I don't know whether I've answered your question, but, but you know, in a way I'm saying that we need to reach out to what is actually affecting people on the ground and we need to involve those people in designing the research and being involved in the research and also to, to listen to their voices about what their experiences are because that is one of the key things that I found in terms of looking at black women and maternal mortality that black women feel they're not being heard by health professionals you know and um, and they're just being ignored and we've got a lot, a lot to do in this area. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, really interesting. And I, I think, I think there's some sort of themes emerging from our discussion around the, um, you know, the, the challenges of, of participation, of bringing, you know, voices that aren't normally heard into the conversation about thinking about how we share our research with those voices. And I wonder if our focus on that across across the group of us is is partly um, an impact of our gender on our career. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm intrigued to see what, what panel members think about how their gender has impacted on their career and, and, and influenced perhaps the focus areas of, of your research. I'm looking for somebody who looks like they want to answer that one. Miriam, go on. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, this is, this is a very interesting question, right, because so, I mean, for me, my gender has impacted both negatively and positively my career. Uh, so it has impacted negatively. When I was in the tech industry, I had a really extremely bad experience. I was in a, in a very toxic culture at some point of my life working where my own line, line manager told me that I didn't deserve to be there and that as a woman, I should be having children and cleaning the kitchen. And I was my online manager and my colleagues, they laugh, they all laugh about it. 
So this is the type of culture where at some point I was into. And that helped me to realize that I didn't want it to be in the tech industry and I moved back to academia. So in that sense, um, it, it has been a positive change. The other thing that I have seen positively for me as a woman is that I have experienced, um, I don't know how to call it, a sisterhood across the academic environment. So I have met many amazing women, uh, many of them here at the OU, which have uh, supported me, uh, encouraged me, uh, gave me a hand, you know, because they have experienced similar things in the past. And they somehow, I felt that, I, I felt very encouraged by, by these women, right? I have uh, lots of amazing uh, friends, people that inspire me. And I think if I would have been a female, maybe I wouldn't have experienced that in my career. So uh, both good things and bad things, I guess. That's an interesting point, absolutely. Kate, can I just to... come in? Oh, no, sorry, Jenny, please. <laughs> yes, um, uh, I want to start off really by saying that um, gender is always race. So, you know, I'm always seen as a black woman. And that is can be positive and it can be negative. And um, listening to some of Miriam's experiences in the workplace, um, I was a senior manager in the, the NHS and I had a white female line manager. And she actually said to me, that I should be really grateful that they appointed me as a senior manager <laughs> because they took a risk on me because I was a black woman. Now, you know, I, I would like to think that we have moved beyond that. But, you know, I'm not absolutely sure about that. Yeah, all of those experiences are unnerving and disturbing. And the fact that there's two panellists with such negative experiences <laughs> of how their gender, or, or as you say, Jenny, the, that intersectional gender and race thing yeah. is, is perceived is quite, quite scary and I'm sure quite illuminating. Kate, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, just to say I absolutely agree with Miriam and Jenny, but also to add about the intersectionality of disability as well, once you start bringing that side of things in, because women are often seen as weaker anyway, if you have a long term health condition or, or something like that, it can really add to that. Um, yeah, negative perception and those experiences that you can have in the workplace. But also to pick up on Miriam's point as well about the incredible, and I love your word sisterhood there, Miriam, it was absolutely right. I was going to say network, but yeah, no, sisterhood is so much nicer. And you, I've really experienced that as well as a positive of being a woman in research and in academia is that the other women that I come into contact with are so always so willing to coach, to support, to give their time and, and really kind of help you. As you say, they've probably experienced this themselves and it's all, it's very much about helping each other up a step. It's a, it's a lovely part of being female in academia. Mm. Yeah, I, I can relate to that too. I think that's probably why Ros was the person that I picked as my inspiring woman as an early female boss that I had that just really coached and supported and encouraged and, and, and diversified her team in every way possible. Mm. We've had a question in from the um, from the audience around um, a piece of advice for someone, perhaps someone who's from a from a lower socioeconomic background who would like to go into research. And they're pointing out that if you're an OU student, you can do your undergraduate and masters in a very flexible way. You can study around work. You can study flexibly in your own time. But PhD and research work in general can be a lot more involved, and and you probably need to be in person. And I, I, think, I think I can probably immediately challenge that just from my knowledge that we do have quite a lot of remote and part-time PhD students at the OU. Um, although certainly if I look at my own field, yes, you would have to be in the lab every day, um, at least conventionally, although I'm sure there are part-time ways to achieve even in those kinds of disciplines. 
I noticed that the, the, the person who's, who's put the message has said that it, it feels quite impossible actually to study at master's and PhD level, given the barriers to go to that higher level. And, and they're looking, I guess, for some advice from us as, as panel members about, about the, the way that you might start to think about going into a PhD or how you might support a PhD. Um, Chinsia, can I start with you on this one? Yes, um, I think one of the, the points that um, you raised, Josie, is also uh, within you know, which discipline um, the person that asked the question is referring to, because um, I think there, is a list, there are some disciplines and some PhD topic areas that lend more easily to um, a sort of long, you know, distant or part-time PhD work. Uh, in my area, certainly that is very feasible. And um, um, I've, I've supervised several PhD students. And although um, none of them have been distance learning from for the old time, I've had PhD students that, for example, started uh, doing more full time and then moved on. I had a PhD student in Pakistan that started with me in the UK and then for family reason she moved there and she collected the data and she did the research there. Um, so um, there are opportunities, it just depends which discipline, as you say, if you need a lab and if you're doing certain type of work is harder, but I would say to that person, try to speak to someone within that discipline and then try to see if there are openings to different way of doing things. I think this is one of the challenges probably we've got at the OU, uh, be more creative in how, um, how we, we've been very creative in our teaching and innovative methods i think uh, i've seen a documentary in the old days when they used to send a lab <laughs> uh, equipment to people's houses so i think we can be more creative actually in a in thinking how we can attract different a variety of students that uh, in this case phd students cannot come to do um to work in campus um so we need to break even the discipline stereotypes in relation to gender, to class and to race. We need to, you know, we need to probably try to think creatively how we can have more men in nursing or, you know, more women in STEM and technology. And certainly we need to work and think how we can attract more BME st students. Uh, this is our challenge is probably uh, the OU. The next challenge, you know, is um, we, need, we need to think creatively. We need to find a, a sort of breakthrough in that. Hmm. It's Can I good. just quickly um, respond Please. to that? Um, I did my second master's and my PhD part-time with a full-time job and with two children. <laughs> um, and I, I'll say it isn't easy, but it just does depend on the kind of um, research that you are doing. I think that what I would say is we are probably more geared up at the Open University to support people to work in that way. I think in a lot of campus universities, um, I think that a lot of a, a lot of academics have been have gone straight through. They've been career academics, and so they don't necessarily have the knowledge and skills to be able to support somebody who is working full time, who's studying part time, and who has a full family life. So I think those are the things that we need to do much more of, and I think that we are actually quite good at that at the OU. I would agree. I think it's an important point. I'm conscious we've got a minute left and I don't want to ignore um, a final question that's come in. So I'm going to try and incorporate it into my wrap up. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. I think we could do this all afternoon and I'd kind of quite like to, um, but I know everybody will have many other things and events to go to go on to. I hope it's given um, people out in the audience there a flavour of the fantastic engaged research women and colleagues that we've got across the OU. 
how we're doing research in many, many topic areas. This has been a tiny scratch of the surface of the fantastic research areas done at the OU. And I, I, I hope it gives you a flavour of the impact that the OU researchers uh, can have on really important questions. Uh, key takeaways from me have been that I would like to have more conversations with our re fantastic researchers, uh, which is always a takeaway whenever I talk to people in, in the teams. Um, there's so much great work going on. And critically, we all want to be in a position where our research across the university is incorporating all of these dimensions. Gender is an important dimension, but actually it's all the dimensions of inequality. And I think I couldn't have had a better panel really to illustrate how inequalities are thought about deeply and carefully in research. And our, our comment from the floor was that actually aging women can sometimes be ignored or almost seen as an afterthought, even when people are taking a gender uh, feminist perspective. And I, I think, you know, we could probably start a whole new session on that topic alone. But I think uh, I hope that colleagues have felt that this has given them a flavour of our research at the OU and the impact we're having on all kinds of gendered issues. Thank you so much, Chinsia, Miriam, Jenny and Kate. Really enjoyed talking to you. I, I think we should schedule a follow up. Um, and thank you so much to everyone for watching. Hope you enjoy the rest of International Women's Day. Keep challenging. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.